Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Alan Chachanov. I'm the chair of the MFA Products of Design program here uh, at SVA in New York City. We're so happy to have you here tonight. So welcome to people who are joining us live. Um, welcome to people who are going to be watching this uh, recording um, after tonight, but we're happy to have you. We are doing this on Zoom like we did last year. Um, it's very nice. People uh, are able to tune in from um, all over the place. I'm very glad that you that you made it. Um, so just maybe uh, say hello in the chat. Um, you can type in the city that you are uh, in right now. Um, and last time we asked people if you could um, learn one new skill, what would it be? Um, maybe you can type in if you could teach one new skill, what would it be? These slides are moving okay? Yes. Great, thanks. All right, hopefully we've got some future teachers in there. Uh, so before we um, start off tonight, I wanted to thank Christina, Christina Lee, Marco Manriquez, um, Alice Hennessy, who's just joined us as our new program coordinator. Um, wonderful to have you, Alice. Um, our alumni and students, uh, faculty and friends, our special guest tonight, Che Costello, and of course, all of you for um, being with us for this about 90 minutes, I would say. Uh, the agenda, we're gonna do a quick uh, overview of the curriculum. Uh, a spotlight on our annual job fair, which is a highlight that lots of people love to learn about. Um, a spotlight on our MoMA partnership, which we are um, ever thrilled about. Um, you're gonna meet um, several students and alumni who are gonna share projects, talk to you a little bit about their lives before products of design, during and after, um, meet some of the faculty. Um, we'll have a, some interesting questions and hopefully um, a few minutes left um, if any of our guests want to um, ask uh, questions or if any of our actually participants and panelists have some questions of each other, um, that would be super nice. We have a commitment to keep things, uh, promise to keep things very visual tonight. Uh, and speaking of visual, you can um, learn so much about our program on our website at productsofdesign.sva.edu. Probably a lot of you have been there. Um, and uh, it's very robust. Um, we have, uh, you know, the mission on our homepage. We have student pages where you can meet all of our students. Uh, faculty page, our incredible faculty, uh, guest lecturers, and field trips and studio visits. Um, and actually, I'm going to take a couple minutes to talk about our uh, curriculum. Um, so let me actually make this full screen. So we break the curriculum down into, into three buckets because there are so many courses, we find that it's very useful for people to organize them. So we really break it down into making uh, structures and narratives. And we lay these courses out along um, the really the, the user journey, the timeline of semester one, two, three, and four. It's a two year, four semester program. Uh, and um, in that curriculum, we go very deep in our, in our specialties. So um, we can take a look at physical product design, for example. So in physical product design, we'll start off with 3D product design. Um, our MoMA partnership, uh, deconstruction, reconstruction, intervention, interaction, design performance, product brand and experience, uh, futuring and speculative design. You can see that there are just so many courses that build one upon another. In digital product design, we're extremely strong, uh, starting off with making studio, UX beyond screens, smart objects, uh, research and design uh, for thesis one, service design and entrepreneurship. Uh, and advanced interaction design. Um, in business, uh, entrepreneurship for sustainability and resilience, business structures, leadership and strategic management, uh, business modeling and social venture design. Uh, we think business is extraordinarily um, important, particularly for designers who often don't have um, a grounding in it. Um, and we have like, you know, the best business teachers. We have one of them here tonight with us actually tonight. Uh, social impact design, we also go extremely deep in uh, starting of, with system scale and consequence, really a foundational course for us since the beginning of the program 10 years ago, uh, moving to design for social value, climate futures, um, uh, a new course, HK is here tonight, public policy design, designing justice, experience design, um, and design delight. Um, and ultimately, uh, really everything points towards a student uh, building their point of view. Uh, and here we begin uh, in a course called Affirming Artifacts, literally a course called Point of View, uh, Behavioral Psychology, um, and um, Julie's here tonight, uh, Information Architecture and Thesis Two, and finally the thesis presentation. So um, you can read uh, what we're calling sort of single one 
uh, magic paragraph descriptions of each of these over 30 courses uh, and learn a little bit more about them. And there's links to the faculty who teach them. So we invite you to do that uh, because we teach so many things. We find it really useful to organize them and share that organization with you tonight. So that's my time. Um, thanks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and welcome our Director of Operations, Christina Lee, um, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the job fair. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Give me one second. I'm just dropping some links in the chat and I'm going to get my keynote set up here. I'm just reading what people are going to teach now that I can see the chat window. Okay, are you guys seeing? What are you guys seeing? Looking good so far. You see my notes? Uh, yes. yes. You do see my notes. Okay, give me one sec. I see. I see. There we go. I think that's good, right? Great. Just the slide? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. It's great to be with you as always. And thank you for joining us for our second open house of the fall. Um, as Alan mentioned, I'm the Director of Operations for the Product of Design Department here at SVA. And I have had the privilege of participating in and organizing three very successful job fairs. Um, which we like to call the design match. Um, this would include last year's remote event and the upcoming event in February, 2022. Um, design match is not your average job fair. It is indeed a networking event in which students meet members of design consultancies and design consultancy members get to meet amazing new student talent. Here's a peek at just of the few companies who have joined us in the past, including Google Creative Labs, Pentagram, Kickstarter, Frog, and our foresight. The job fair is a networking event. However, it is structured more like a speed dating event in which students and design leaders alike get the opportunity to find the best match for the future. So what does that mean and how does that work? Starting from the day they enter the program, POD students work hard to build their design portfolios and refine their presentation skills for their graduate thesis work and beyond. At the job fair, students get the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with 10 individual companies for a 10 to 12 minute conversation. Companies are stationed in the VFL, uh, which is the Visible Futures Lab, the maker space, which is adjacent to the department. Here's another view of a meeting happening in the VFL. And of course, interviewers or interviews occur in the classrooms of our departments. Um, here is a view of the North classroom during the job fair meetings. Uh, so during this conversation meeting speed date moment, students get to showcase their portfolio work practice their conversational skills, and have the opportunity to make connections with potential friends, employers, business partners, and collaborators. We say that when a match happens, everyone knows it. Through all of the chatter, sharing, and getting to know you, several students find that they instinctively know who they want to work with and vice versa. And these initial meetings create a moment for students to follow up, make connections, and expand their community. Essentially, Design Match is a door opener. And while Design Match is about networking and being professional, it is also highly social, fun, and catered. Um, for in-person events in the past, we've had the amazing Rosa Mexicana provide delicious catering, uh, making their amazing fresh-to-order guacamole on the food mobile carts 
uh, that add to the energy and the atmosphere of the day. They make incredible tacos. And we also hire bartenders who make a signature cocktail each year. And there's plenty of time for everyone to socialize and let loose after the meetings conclude. Woo! That one, I still don't know why that one's animated. Um, overall, Design Match is one of the most exciting and anticipated moments in the program, and the students always do a killer job. Uh, lastly, here is a short list, which is just a sample of some of the companies who have participated over the years. So I'll give you a second to view that list. Um, thanks for listening, and we look forward to hosting this year's upcoming 2022 event, and I hope to see some of you there in the near future. Thanks so and much, I Christina. Think, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Who's next? Well, actually, I, I think I kind of forgot to mention that we're starting with the job fair um, a little bit ironically because so many of our prospective students want to talk about, well, what do your students do after they graduate? Um, and we want to tell you a little bit about what we do while you're here for two years, but we know that you're really interested at the end. So that's why we thought it might be uh, fun to start the open house uh, with that, with how things uh, will help launch you into your, your professional careers. Um, next up is Che Costello from the Museum of Modern Art. Um, so we have been working with, uh, the, with MoMA Wholesale for several years now. Che will tell you a little bit more about it. Um, this is an extraordinary opportunity um, that's been um, really cherished and exclusive to our department. Che, we're so happy to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, Che. I'm thrilled to be here. Is everyone seeing my screen okay? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Well, as Alan so kindly introduced me, I'm Che Costello. I am the Associate Director of Merchandising at the Museum of Modern Art. I've worked at MoMA for over 20 years in many different roles. My current role is I oversee the buying team for MoMA Design Store, our online store. And here's an image of some of our stores in New York, in Japan, um, and in Hong Kong. And our stores are really an opportunity for us to extend the reach of the museum beyond our home in Mid town in many ways. And it's worth noting that MoMA also has this really rich history with design. MoMA was the first museum to have a curatorial department dedicated to modern design and architecture. It was founded in 1932. And at MoMA Design Store, we see us very much working in that tradition of bringing good design to as many people as possible. Now, together with my colleague, Gabrielle Zola, who oversees our wholesale business, I have had the pleasure of working with the SBA Products of Design students for eight years now. And I know Gabrielle would agree with me to say that it is one of the most pleasurable partnerships we get to work on together. And it's really mutually beneficial. What we're looking for is to find new designers to develop products for a wholesale business. And what the students get out of it is they get to really see this nuts and bolts element of business. They get to see how you structure pricing, how you think about manufacturing constraints and packaging, who your target audience is. Um, and then we get to really participate in the design process with the students in a way we don't usually get to do. In fact, this is some images of our wholesale catalogs. Well, you see, we have whole spreads dedicated to designs from SVA students. And we found that that's really meaningful to our customers at both the wholesale and the retail level. They love to hear the stories of this collaboration and how we work together. And some of our wholesale customers are other major museums throughout the world, um, websites, digital platforms, department stores, design boutiques, and, and gift stores. This is an image of Gabrielle and I at a kickoff meeting um, where we kind of describe to the students about MoMA and MoMA Design Store and we give them a design challenge each year. Each one is different and tailored to the, the moment. And then this is one of my favorite parts. We get to check in with the students throughout the year. And this image is we did this kind of round robin like speed dating where the students were giving us design after design. And we were rapid fire giving them feedback. And it was just really dynamic uh, and exciting proposition. And we also sat with them and challenged some of their their um, designs and they gave us some great answers. And then the best part is at the very end, there's a presentation of the final designs, which is always this wonderful moment of seeing all the dialogue we've had over time and the products that come out of it. 
Uh, this is Pranesa Kunpasar, and she was one of the first students to have a product made by MoMA. And she's this great example of, she had this like set of stacking bowls. And at that time we were really, really um, attracted to the design language of the forms she was using, but we didn't need bowls, we needed coasters. And she really took that note and she made this terrific um, you know, set of coasters that we still sell today. And then after five years of working together, we had the opportunity to celebrate our collaboration. This is actually MoMA Design Store on 53rd Street facing the museum itself. Uh, students took over the windows. They took all of the photography. These are actually videos. So you see the products in action. There are those um, coasters all the way to the right. And then the students also uh, moved into the store and really worked with us to do all of the displays. They did the wraps, they did the storytelling. And of course, we had to have a party to celebrate, and it was a really vibrant, wonderful event, well attended by the design community, the press really was excited by the story, wanted to be there and interview the students, folks from MoMA and SVA all got together um, to celebrate this, but the collaborate, and these are the students that were uh, profiled um, that day, but the collaboration keeps going on and on. These are a couple of newer designs that were designed by SVA products of design students, now manufactured and sold under the MoMA brand. This is the fold by number um, napkins by Julia Lynn Painter, where each napkin has instructions to create a unique, beautiful shape. It's very vibrant and colorful. There's the writer's block set where you could display your pens and pencils, but also play the peg game. Uh, more recent designs, the roller coasters, we were really amazed by because the student took the function of the coaster and added a new function to it. So the material of this coaster is aquaphobic. So when it condenses, it creates these like little almost beads of water and you could go through the maze with your bead of water. And then the Finestra bookend is a great example of the student really responding to a prompt. We were searching the market at Moma Design Store for great bookends. Our customers were asking for them. They were either too minimal or too ornate. And the student came up with this beautiful stacking set for bookends. And that's kind of a quick overview of where we've gone so far. And I think what's really exciting is each year brings a new challenge. And we're really, really thrilled to find out what we're going to discover together next. That's so great, thank you, Che. Uh, and again, MoMA's never worked with this school before and we've been doing this for several years now. Che, you said that this, is, um, uh, this experience has made you think differently about the design process because you get pitched like a thousand product ideas a year or something? We review thousands of products a year and a very small percentage of those we bring into our line and even smaller percentage, we, we actually manufacture and sell under our brand. So it's really unprecedented the number of designs that have come out of this collaboration for us. Oh, we're so, so proud. Um, and it's holiday season. So we'll actually, you know what, in the chat, we'll put a link to the MoMA stores. So it's not too late. Um, thank you so much, Shay, for joining Shipping us. Shipping cut off is the 16th, so get oh, busy. All right, put that in the chat, thank you. Um, I think we're going to, um, uh, we're moving to like a student and alumni section. We're going to actually start with Monica Albernoz, who was, is one of our first year students. And she was at, I think, two of the open house events last year. Um, and so it's really special to have you here sharing in this open house tonight. Welcome, Monica. Thank you, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share. Can you see my screen? Yes. Do you see the Zoom windows on the right? Or no? I don't think so. I think it looks okay, good. Great. We see uh, just okay, your name perfect. in the slide. Yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, hi everyone, I'm Monica and I'm really excited to be sharing with you some projects from uh, this first semester at POD. So my first project is a rain inspired vest. Uh, it's a costume that we made for our making studio class. Um, and it really started, you know, from the basics. I made a sketch, I had an idea, I searched the internet for a pattern for the vest and moved on to set out my LEDs alter some code and find the, the pattern of raindrops that I really wanted. 
Um, I even made the vest myself. And what I want to point out about this project is that both the coding and the making part of it were so frustrating. It was one step forward, two steps back the whole way. But at the very end, when the code finally works and you're literally just sewing the last pieces of uh, thread in and it fits, it's the most wonderful feeling in the world. Um, at the very end of it, we got to celebrate by marching with our class in the New York City Halloween Parade. The next project I want to share with you is for our 3D product design one course, which is a more kind of traditional industrial design course. I have a background in art and sculpture, but I'd never ever really made products. Um, so this is uh, my design, my idea. It's a scan a bug handheld home product that helps you find bugs wherever they're hiding in your house. And it started actually with something more familiar to me, which is sculpture. The photo all the way on the left is a sculptural form that uses volumes, planes, and lines. And we took this form and thought about how might the body interact with it? We iterated using kind of that knowledge and those sketches and moved on to add buttons and materials and thinking about ergonomics and does these pieces actually fit together? Is it too heavy? If I lift it up, will it break? So really learning by doing and um, refining by sketching. So this was all very difficult for me because I, I drawn a lot, but never like this. And um, in the end, after, you know, sanding the last few pieces, choosing the color of my product, doing lots of crits every single week, um, this is uh, what it turned out to be. So I'm so very proud. And finally, uh, for our Entrepreneurship for Sustainability and Resilience class, this class is uh, centered around sustainability in food. And I found this graph, which uh, really kind of shook me because what it says is by 2050, we need 56% more food, but we need that without using any more land and while lowering emissions. So sounds kind of impossible. But it turns out that some of this alternative technology already exists and is very simple. For example, edible insects. Uh, the practice of eating insects is called entomophagy and I kind of completely stumbled upon this. What I learned is that edible insects are actually very, very sustainable. It pretty much checks off all the boxes of what we need for alternative and sustainable food. So I mapped it out and um, learned that it's actually a growing market, um, but Westerners are disgusted by bugs. So that's a huge hurdle in the growth of this, of this market and, and its potential to help prevent food shortages could be hindered by this disgust issue. So I began thinking, how do we approach it? I thought about uh, foods that were considered maybe not so appealing in the past by Westerners like kale and sushi, and did more research, learned that uh, something counterintuitive, but telling people to eat insects for the sake of the planet won't convince a stomach that has already said no. Instead, it's the repeated positive exposure to edible insects that can raise awareness and could encourage consumption. And this is what I really wanted to hold on to. We should make this fun. Let's not greenwash it, even if it's not greenwashed. Uh, fun is better. So I thought about uh, moments of fun, like food festivals, media. Turns out celebrities are already endorsing edible insects and also music. So this is my solution. It's EntoFest. And it's a positive encounter with edible insects in a lively environment. It merges food, music, and press to really make a buzz and have kind of invite people to come in and try insects. The final deliverable for a class is a pitch deck. And these are some of the slides that I've been working on. This is still an ongoing project. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Monica. Um, and I wanna actually particularly thank you for uh, showing a lot of process photos. I know designers show a lot of finished things and on our website, we show a lot of very finished, very beautiful, refined pieces of design. Um, and designers are always very reticent to show some of the early, you know, messier stuff. And so I'm just so thrilled that you included that work. So I think it's really important to see people, particularly who don't have design backgrounds, um, how projects actually start and how they evolve. Um, and that we actually teach 
these skills from the beginning. So Monica, before tonight, I actually went up to you and I said, so I wonder if there was something that you wish that you had learned when you were in the open house last um, November and December. And you actually had a great answer for me, which was um, I actually wanted to learn a little bit more about what it was like to like be there. I, I understood a lot from the open house and the websites about the curriculum and teachers and um, and everything that was offered, but what was it like to actually live in New York City and go to go to school? So maybe you can share a little bit of, about that with our visitors tonight. Totally, yeah. Um, well, I think the people, really the students of the program is everything I, I had dreamed of because I know community mm. is super important. Um, and even though we're like making work all the time, um, I don't think I do New York as much right now because I'm, I'm doing school. Um, I'm doing school with people who are incredible and they bring the world with them. Um, our cohort is so diverse. Um, it's so exciting. We sometimes go out and kind of eat food from a place um, that is the background of someone else. So they tell us about, you know, no, this is the way you pronounce it. No, don't eat it with that sauce. And like, this is completely Americanized or whatever. And um, I think that's a new type of New York that I haven't had a chance to have before. Um, and it's New York through people, not New York through going to events or New York through going to museums. Um, and it's been really wonderful. Oh, this is so nice to hear. Thanks so much for sharing all this, Monica. Um, Sovic, I think we're gonna um, go to you next. Uh, Sovic is one of our alumni. And if you wanted to unmute and share, great, thank you, welcome. Sure, uh, can you hear me okay? Great, Perfect. Um, so, as Alan mentioned, my name's Sovic. I was a member of the class of 2016 at TOD. And um, I have a confession, which is that I've been working on my graduate school thesis for the last six years. And if you're not careful uh, after going to POD, that might happen to you too. Um, but to explain how I got here, I think it's important to uh, tell a little bit about where I came from. So before products of design, I was the furthest thing from a designer. Um, I graduated from Harvard uh, with a degree in social studies, which is a fancy way of saying econ and government. And because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life, I decided that I'd do what everyone does and I'd become an equity finance trader at JP Morgan. Um, and so, you know, working in finance, I was working 11, 12 hour days, which, um, you know, meant that I was spending most of my waking life at work. And that by itself wasn't really the, the thing that upset me. I think what I realized was if I'm spending most of my life at work, I wanted to be doing something that I believe in. And I came to the conclusion that while the work in finance was interesting, um, it wasn't exactly aligned with my values. And so I started doing some searching. And at that time, around 2012, uh, the iPhone had been around for five years. And so everywhere you looked, there are these retrospectives about how iPhones had changed the nature of computing as we knew it. Sure, before the iPhone existed, there are things like the Palm Pilot that had exactly the same capabilities. It could connect to the internet, you could check your calendar and your email. But for some reason, this device by 2012 made it so that if you went to a place in rural India, it was more likely that someone was accessing the internet through their phone than through an actual computer. And so I tried to really understand and contextualize why that was the case and came to the conclusion that because all the technology already existed, it really had to be how this product was designed that made the difference and really spread that impact throughout the world. And this was the conclusion that I came to. Design has the power to change the world and make real impact. And so I applied to a number of different design schools, uh, ended up interviewing, um, at Product of Design, the only interview that I actually had to give uh, to get into grad school. And as part of that, I toured the space and the studio and absolutely fell in love and decided to, um, to join the next cohort of Product of Design. Two weeks before uh, grad school started, um, a, a dear friend of mine who is actually uh, my future sister-in-law, she was in a car accident and she sustained a spinal cord injury. And so I was basically in the ICU and acute rehab for the two weeks leading into orientation. Along the way, I had to kind of contend with the decision of whether or not to even go to design school, ultimately decided to follow the plan, go to POD, 
Um, but I was kind of left with this conclusion. If design could truly change the world, then it should be able to help in this really specific situation with someone that I really cared about who is going through a, a really difficult time. And so when I was at Products of Design, um, I ended up focusing my graduate thesis on design for spinal cord injuries. And so um, as, uh, as many other students have done before me and after me, uh, my thesis took many forms. Um, so uh, as part of my thesis, I designed a service called Test Drive. I learned from Karina that uh, the first wheelchair that someone uses out of, uh, out of the hospital is often really poorly fitted but it's this mad rush to get into a custom wheelchair that leads them to use their precious insurance dollars uh, to get that wheelchair. Um, so I envisioned a marketplace where people would lend each other their used wheelchairs so that people could actually find out what they needed uh, before they actually committed their insurance dollars and would allow people to get better fitting wheelchairs and more independence. I created an app called Journey that used voice to recognize emotional state to connect users to their peers, especially because a lot of times the physicians and nurses at these hospitals don't really know what it's like to live with a spinal cord injury because they don't have one. And so um, this was a way to connect people uh, to their peers who had more context for what lay ahead of the person going through rehabilitation. I created an untitled thesis campaign um, that really centered on visualizing the inequities in the built environment that prevent people from disabilities from engaging in their communities. Um, so as an example, the New York City subway is notoriously inaccessible um, and calling that out prominently in a public way was something that I um, you know, thought through the ramifications of during my thesis. And then finally, um, the product that I designed um, during my thesis was called CleanCat. Uh, so I learned that people who use, uh, who have spinal cord injuries use between six and eight single use intermittent catheters a day. And that oftentimes insurance won't pay for the amount of catheters that they need. Imagine not getting coverage from insurance to be able to pee. Um, and so this was an incredibly significant problem that I, I really wanted to focus on and so I developed a UVC powered catheter sterilizer um, to help people safely reuse their catheters. And after POD, I was still uh, left with this question of what does it take to make a concept design real? And so through, um, through the job fair, I ended up getting a job at J&J Design where I sat at the intersection of business development and design strategy. And then I also uh, participated in this program that SVA just launched called the Ground Floor Incubator. This allowed me to take my thesis ideas and continue to evolve them. And in 2018, I ended up quitting John, or, well, so, sorry, I uh, forgot about this slide. So basically, um, through that process, ended up getting a bunch of different recognition um, for the work that I was doing on, um, on CleanCath and the product that I had developed, including getting into startup accelerators like Mass Challenge and winning some funding for the company uh, and the product. And so fast forward um, six years after, or five years after graduating, uh, I am the CEO of a startup named Ori, where we partner with people living with disabilities to co-create medical devices, products, and services that help improve independence and health. Uh, we've been able to raise $2 million of investment to date, $500,000 of grants. I have employees, which is crazy. Uh, it's a team of five and we have patents and we're working on making the product from my thesis a reality. Uh, and that's it for me. Oh, still just so moved um, by this work. It, it, it does seem like yesterday a little bit, but um, five years Five years passed. Congratulations on your recent fundraising. Uh, fundraising. Um, I guess I, I, the question I have for you is: you know, you are one of the the alumni who have um, continued their thesis project, and we have some. And I'm wondering if there's something that um, you gained while being in grad school that has sustained you, that has you know sort of helped you sort of hold on to this dream and like never give up to put anything out into the world never mind the medical device is you know next next to impossible and takes incredible drive and determination i think you have an entrepreneurial spirit to begin with 
but is there something that your community here at grad school, your time fortified you with that might be um, unique and something um, that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that there are a couple of things. Um, you know, one is definitely comfort with ambiguity. Like, I think there are lots of times in grad school where you just kind of have to make things and mm. figure everything else out later. Um, and there are so many times in uh, the journey of an entrepreneur where you have to do exactly that. Um, the ability to deal with pressing deadlines and too much work all the time. I still get more sleep now than I did in grad school. Um, so that was a really key. Uh, and no one, no one needs to remember that there. part. We'll, we'll edit that out. That's yeah. good. Uh, and then I think um, the last thing is just like the the emphasis of the myth of like the genius designer, the emphasis of always connecting with users and trying to be a responsible steward. Um, and, you know, keeping in mind that the things that you put out in the world have consequences and trying to to really own up to that responsibility um, and to make sure that you're doing right by your stakeholders. Thank you so much, Sovic. Thanks for sharing this. Um, Arshi, let's um, move to you if you're ready to um, unmute and share your screen. Um, Arshi is one of our new first year students. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Alan. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay, let me know if you, everything is okay. You can see my screen. Looks good. Perfect. So hi everyone, today I'm going to introduce you to one of our classes, Affirming Artifacts, which is a course with our chair, Alan. So it's a 10 week intensive course aimed at introducing us to different approaches of design through a very simple prompt. Redesign the next thing you throw out. So some of my classmates threw out a mask, a bug, a box, but for me, I threw out a small piece of cotton ball. And I wanna introduce you to Nuage. It's an organization which promotes napping as a tool for increasing productivity and wellness. So we started off as using sketching as an ideation tool and came up with a hundred redesigns. And we narrowed that down into three ideas to prototype. I did an antiseptic pen, a sweatproof t-shirt, and the tablet pillow. I choose to move forward with the tablet pillow. It can be easily folded and can be transformed into a pillow, allowing you to take naps on the go. Uh, we also built a better prototype with a complete unboxing experience and wanting to create this feeling of sleeping in the clouds. So moving on from a product to a service, our research shows that taking naps increase mindfulness in the workspace, reduces stress, also enhances task performance. Uh, so in order to communicate this transition from products to service, we did storyboarding. And this was actually my first time being introduced to storyboarding. I had no previous work. So this was really helpful tool to visualize different user scenarios. We also uh, placed our products and services to form imaginary partnership with real brands. So for me, it was 23andMe, Swell, and Logitech. With 23andMe, we formed a sleep lab where we do DNA testing and sleep disorders. Our partnership with Swell, we do sustainable kits to increase productivity and wellness at work. And lastly, with Logitech, we are able to set a routine for work increase your comfort and wellness at work, which is really what Nuage is all about. Uh, so everything has an app. <laughs> so building onto the core values of taking intentional breaks, I wanted to focus on the Pomodoro technique. It's a technique where you set a certain amount of time to do work and you take breaks periodically and you repeat that cycle where you become more productive. So I'll jump into the app and I'll introduce my user. 
She is Charvi, one of my classmates. And she says, I have many things to do, but it feels like more than I can handle. So the app is a way for her to uh, increase her productivity at school. On her dashboard, she can track her Pomodoro activities, how many assignments she did and how many hours, how many breaks she took. And during her break, she can find an, a joy activity that she wants to take. If she wants to take a nap, she can get the direction to the nearest pod to get to take a nap. If she wants to connect with a friend uh, for a coffee break, she can choose from her friends who are online. And lastly, on her profile, she can track her progress and see all the achievements for the week that she's been working on. And so a few weeks into the course, we already built a product, multiple services, an app, and now we build an online platform to expand our brand. And now I'm introducing Metro Naps by Nuage. It's a website where it's virtual reality experience that's interactive, but really you get to experience how the world naps. And this is introducing the platform. Uh, you get to experience how the world naps. It's a wellness resort and you can choose a nap pod near you. And it's a virtual reality experience that's immersive. You can experience, you can take a nap pod in, and experience rainfall or the sound of waves to help you fall asleep. You can also experience the sound of nature. But really this this website is about how the world naps because everywhere around the world, people nap differently. You can experience the Spanish siesta to the Japanese inamuri or even space nap. So you could book a Spanish siesta in one of the nap pods from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., which is usually when the Spanish take naps during the day. And you could also experience a Scandinavian winter nap. And research has showed that if you take naps in a cold weather, you actually sleep better. And you could also float a nap in space, but unfortunately this event is sold out. <laughs> and lastly, to promote a multitude of products, we designed some marketing campaign with an app called Live Surface. I'll go through some of these and we also have some products on our website that helps with taking naps. So really to conclude um, this class, Affirming Artifact was really a great way to be introduced to products of design. Uh, we got to explore everything from service design to marketing campaigns, to research and critical thinking, and even an app and platform design. Uh, it was really everything you could do in 10 weeks and it was amazing. So thank you. Uh, this is my presentation. Yeah, Arshi, thank you so much. I can't believe you got all of this work. You're so prolific um, into so few minutes as well. Thanks for putting this together. Um, yeah, it's such a great project. I love learning about all the different naps and to think that this started with a piece of garbage is just pretty unbelievable. So Arshi, you're 13 weeks into this program. I think I wanted to ask you just like what you're what's been like the biggest you know delight for you um in being here you look very happy and excited every day walking around and you look delighted uh -huh. and i just thought i would ask you yeah i i really can't believe that the first semester is almost over like everyone's rushing to finish the finals but really the most delight coming in i didn't realize the various backgrounds that everyone had and it really the people because our class is so diverse. Everyone comes from different backgrounds. We have industrial design, graphic designers, even dance background. So it's really amazing how we have this diverse group, but we're all here together to like learn more about all aspects of design. I think that's been the most surprising because I come from a background of architecture and I didn't know much about product design. And this course is 
everything you can imagine. <laughs> it's been great. That's so nice to hear. Thanks so much, Arshi. Yeah. Um, Bernice, um, can we move to you? Bernice is one of our extraordinary alumni. And um, maybe you can uh, share your screen, take it away. Welcome. Yes, um, let me see. Is this working? Perfect. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bernice. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm very excited to talk to you about um, where I am today after graduating um, as part of the class of 2018. Uh, so a bit about myself to start. Uh, I'm currently working remotely as a product designer uh, at an American grocer called Albertsons. Uh, I live in San Francisco with my partner and uh, the love of my life, my cat. <laughs> uh, his name is Jose. So I wanted to start off by sharing, you know, why I took the path of design graduate school. So um, I came from business school, from a marketing background, and I was really kind of floating around doing contract work. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what um, sort of between what I previously saw as a practical path for my career and what I was always told that I was good at, uh, which was really in the world of you know, illustration and graphic design. Um, so for me, the decision to go to grad school was really uh, around you know, three things. One, I really wanted that like validation and qualification. Um, you know, everyone, we all deal with imposter syndrome. Um, I wanted to meet uh, different people you know, who were doing the careers that I was uh, interested in exploring. And third, of course, um, wanting to practice and improve the skills, um, the design hard skills that um, you know, I didn't know uh, what I didn't know. Um, and what did I really get out of it? I, I would say definitely, you know, all of those things um, through Design Match. Um, I, I met Luminary Labs, which was my first job out of school. Um, and they are a boutique innovation consultancy, um, which really brought together um, that background in business and that design world. Um, you know, I really wanted to be in the space of strategic design. And, and that was, you know, what I like one to one got out of the school. Um, on top of that, I would say, you know, getting a better sense of that landscape of design roles that are out there. Um, I, I would say that I'm, I'm really just beginning um, to sort of carve that, that path, that career that I want, you know, forming what is the role, what is the role that I have in my organization today, uh, as well as in the future. Uh, and then one of the most magical things, especially as someone whose background was really about like looking at the outside world and what already existed, uh, is to start and really understand that you also have the power to, um, you know, create something out of nothing. And so, for example, this was a group project that I did while in school where we were just interested in like watching videos of other people doing parkour. Um, but what is that? What can we do with that? Right? We could learn how to sew, how to design clothing, um, and took that really to you know, um, creating a, two pairs of pants, like running a photo shoot, like doing, like modeling the pants ourselves, or creating a brand around it and a, and a business platform. Um, so of course the cornerstone of the graduate school experience is thesis. Uh, and as a child of immigrants, I really wanted to learn more about um, migration, about labor rights, and especially how our existing uh, labor systems discriminate against the labor of particularly black and brown people. And so my thesis ended up focusing on agricultural labor uh, as a means to narrow in on that question, um, especially after learning how farm workers were historically excluded from um, different workers' rights leg legislation um, that make work you know, more fair for others today. Think things like minimum wage um, and sick leave benefits. I'll highlight one of the projects um, that I did while uh, doing my thesis uh, on making international remittance uh, more affordable for these types of workers. And so a concept I learned about was informal lending circles that exist all over the world where people pool resources as a community and can use that pool of money to um, support one another in emergencies. So I wanted to uh, leverage this idea when it comes to um, remitting um, money across borders as fees as a percentage of total are very different um, depending on how much you're, you're sending. So for example, it can be free to $10 to send $10,000 anywhere in the world, but it might cost you $100 or $200 to, as an individual, send $1,500. 
Um, so imagine this collective remittance service brought to life. Um, I mapped you know, a service journey of how you would uh, deposit and collect money, um, both if you were banked or unbanked. Um, and of course, designing um, a simple you know, user-facing um, app to digitally manage your uh, saving pool across borders. So after school, um, uh, as mentioned, I started working at Luminary Labs, uh, where we primarily work with federal government um, and healthcare clients. And so these are three of the programs that um, I, I ran and supported while I was there. The first, uh, for example, is uh, CT Mission CubeSat, where we helped high school students um, design, prototype, and you know, launch their own small satellites um, into like lower Earth orbit, and you know, really supported their scientific research um, and and their their career dreams. Um, currently, I work at Albertsons, um, and you know, with the pandemic, I was really interested in learning more about how we uh, access food, can gather around food, um, and so I joined this team um, about six seven months ago. Uh, we recently launched uh, the app back in March, and there are lots of improvements to be made. I'd say the, the takeaway so far in, in my time here has been um, how interesting it is to work on a very imperfect product um, and then to be part of a team that um, is, is making it better and, and can make that change. Um, so that's, that's my story. I wanted to put my personal email out there. I'm always open um, if anyone is still curious about making this decision um, um, and wanting to chat more about um, my experience and ask questions. Well, thanks for offering that, Bernice. Uh, actually, I should mention that uh, all of the students' contact information, all the alumni are on the website, and they actually love hearing from um, prospective students. So I think people think that they, you know, sort of can't or shouldn't reach out, but absolutely. And Bernice, thank you for being very um, inviting about people just reaching out to see what it's like. Uh, you know, the follow-up question I had for you is about um, community. Um, so you've been out for, you know, a few years, several years. And um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about, like, you know, you've been really active in coming back and helping students you know, um, rehearse like thesis presentations and job fair and just what it's like to be part of this, you know, community, this family, this, you know, decade long, um, you know, journey really. Um, and maybe the place that that community has in your life uh, beyond the sort of professional. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the key thing uh, I think about with this community is that it's, it's not just like a, a give relationship when you're reaching out to an alumni. Like I get so inspired um, whenever a current student reaches out to me. Uh, it gives me so much. Like I, I take that those learnings um, and apply that in my in my career, and hopefully vice versa with the advice that I can give. So really, I feel like it's like it's never a one way street when it comes to friendship, mentorship, um, a community, and, and all of those things. Um, yeah, and, and, and the community continues to grow with every year, every class. Uh, I know I, I grow more distant from the current students with the years, um, but, but not truly, right? Like we're all available as resources um, and we're all around. <laughs> That's so nice to hear. Thanks so much, Bernice. Um, Bauchi, are you available to... Um... Uh, share your screen and um, and share. Um, I think you're going to be sharing your uh, part of your thesis project. Bauchi is one of our second year students. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Alan. So, hi, I'm Bauchi, a second year student in POD, and my thesis topic is about like tech ethics in STEM education. So I will talk about my work in process. Let's look at some data first. In November 2019, Department of Education invested like $504 to support STEM education. So why the big check to support STEM education? So we all know STEM education is very essential. So let's take a look at the STEM model we're using now. I would argue what we are missing from this model is another E, is ethics. Jackie Gerson, a teacher at both the universities, said uh, like ethical decision-making 
should be included as 21st century skill. We're living in the most complex era of human history. So why ethics in STEM education is so important? It helps students develop critical thinking skills, explore and evaluate real problems, and also help them engage independently with the internet, help ethical decision-making, and also prepare for the future challenge. So how can students learn the tech ethics in STEM education? In a fun way. So that's why I designed a game for teen coders to learn AI ethics in an immersive and gameful way. Learning tech ethics is, isn't always fun unless the point is learning through a game. In this game, each player is a resident of the AI society and players will practice their knowledge of AI system, help their organisms grow, and also become more responsible e-citizens. There are two main parts of this game, learning and motivations to learn. Let's look at learning first. There are five learning objectives for this game. Understand basic mechanics of the AI system, understand the AI system are not neutral sources, and also recognize the many stakeholders and consider the impact of technology. There are also five lessons that I want my users to learn from this game. Number one, accountability. AI systems require human oversight because this technology are complex and can change. Each player can have their own organism organism in this game and also like every decision they make in this game affect the growth of this organism. Number two, inclusiveness and fairness. AI systems need to be fair and representative of those who use them. Let's see how it works. You click on the light point and read the information and decided it's a harmful AI system logic. Success in this identifying and removing the harmful ones wins the point for users. Oh my gosh, the number, of times number three, explainability and interpretability. So the quests in the game help users better understand the knowledge related to AI systems. User can invite the neighbors in the game to collaborate on challenges and receive rewards. Number four, data value and rights. The game also have modules related to data value. Also, is first user needs to estimate the value of some personal data. And then the game will provide real world examples to help users think differently about data value. By clicking on the model on the screen, the user can feel the relationship between different data. In the process of exploring, user will find some Easter egg knowledge. By doing this, user can learn actual rewards to the plans. The game also provides users with, with some real-world case studies to learn more about how the AS system works. Let's talk about like the motivation to learn. Users will unlock digital cards in the game, and they also use the points to get AR posters and terminology cards. So I'm still working on the AI models for that card, and here's some reference demo. I hope the male AI citizen prototype serves the goal of combine play with tech ethics through games, keep learning open-ended, and encourage collaboration, and help students prepare for the future challenge. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bauchi. It's actually amazing to see um, this work tonight because I know just a week ago in class, um, the, the, the change and the iteration and development um, of the thinking of this platform and game mechanics and even just the graphic design, it's just incredible what you're able to accomplish week after week. Um, the thesis uh, in the third semester, the right to follow the second year is only one course. Uh, in the fourth semester, it's really every course. Do you have some um, specific hopes and dreams that you have for what you'd like to build in the next semester? Or are you just going to sort of let it unfold? Um, what, are, what are you thinking about? What are you dreaming about? 
I'm thinking about like having some workshop, co-workshop mm. with like more people and the the STEM education and industrial, and also invite more invite my users to this design process. Yeah, I mean certainly and, the. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Mm. Yeah. That's it. Uh, certainly the ethics and AI is just such an unbelievably urgent topic right now. Um, has it been encouraging to read all the different news stories or is it, is it, is it sort of crowding you or is it giving you energy to keep going? Yeah, I'm so passionate about this topic and actually I'm doing like a e-learning course about like tech ethics and also I start to like know more people in the STEM education industrial and kind of have great inspiring interviews with them. Amazing. I'm hoping you're going to be a teacher um, one day too. So I'll have to talk more about that. Thank you so much, Bauchi. And um, we have one more um, uh, alumni to, to share work with you. Uh, visit us today, Helen Chen. Um, welcome, Helen. Are you ready to um, share and share and share? Um, Yes, I should Welcome. be using just, hey everyone, um, let me just pull it up. All good, can everyone see my screen? Perfect, awesome. Hey everyone, um, it's nice to meet you all. My name is Helen and I was a part of the seventh class, I believe. So I graduated in May, 2020, um, you know, right at the height of the pandemic. So that was really interesting to go from kind of like in-person, a um, lot of prototyping to how do we do design and experimentation in a completely new way. So I'll talk about a bit about that later. But um, just to like introduce myself. Um, so I'm Helen Yun Chen and I consider myself a transdisciplinary medium agnostic designer. Um, so what that means, um, but I'll go into that in a bit, uh, but just to give you an overview of what I'm doing right now since graduation is I'm currently an experienced designer at RGA in Portland. Um, and I also on the side run my own design practice where I work with emerging businesses and cultural institutions on brand and experience projects. So, I don't know if Alan has shown you that iconic POD slide of all the things that we learn um, throughout um, the program, but I just wanted to say that it's been um, really interesting how that's translated. So here are some of like the professional titles and roles I've had through freelance and professional work. Um, some of them, you know, cross over, but some of them are in different but related territories and it is possible to um, do it all, even though it might seem really chaotic when you're in the program trying to like figure out who am I? I think um, rather than pinpointing yourself as a specific type of designer, just go with what you're passionate about and it'll fill into these like little gaps and spaces. So how is that possible, um, you know, to have like worked these different roles and juggle them. I think for me, it's because through POD, I kind of formulated my own perspective on what design means to me. And for me, it's about um, having a deep and wide understanding of the infrastructure of the systems where problems and challenges reside, and then leveraging the necessary tools, insights, and collaborations to go from a current state to a desired state. So this is where, um, like by leveraging the necessary tools and insights, I mean um, as a medium agnostic designer in that I don't really think about like what platforms I need to design on until I really understand the system and the problem itself. So um, I'll be showing how I do this through some example projects I worked on at POD, as well as some of the work that I do now. So um, at POD, I was really interested at the intersection of emerging technologies and new materials and sustainability. So this was the project that I did um, from affirming artifacts where uh, the thing that I threw away was a plastic bag. So I created a whole 
entire um, like business around it where I was simultaneously experimenting with what can you do with this plastic waste and then integrating it into what is the digital ecosystem experience of that from e-commerce to um, also made a movie about a red plastic bag. So I was running around New York City um, like a crazy person with a plastic bag tied to a string. Um, so some of the other works I've done is um, looking at how can we leverage um, machine learning and image recognition to improve the um, composting and general like waste management process in New York City. Um, to working on really fun branding projects. Um, this was a product brand and experience where a team and I made this really beautiful mushroom drink um, and created a whole like business model off of it, um, a whole brand ecosystem. I've actually had people contact me asking me where they can buy this. So that was really cool. Um, so then finally, I'll go into um, the favorite project that I've done at POD, which is my thesis. Um, this thesis was a very interesting journey for me because it was really experimental and I did a ton of different things with um, different like materials and ultimately decided on looking at mushrooms as a metaphor and a actual like infrastructural possibility for um, like basically healing our environmental damages. So this is a glimpse into like all of the things I did in the VFL and the POD kitchen um, where I got like a lot of weird stares because I was like working with like kind of weird and smelly materials and um, I had fungi like growing under my desk, um, not the invasive type. And then this was interesting because I, oops, sorry, I am not the best at going through presentations today because I just came from one. But this was um, another experiment I did during thesis when we were in lockdown. Um, so this was thinking about how can we take these experiences that we're thinking about um, and thinking about educational platforms and physical experiences and bring them into a digital space. So I was able to play around and create an experience in VR that was teaching people about how you can grow mushrooms from food waste um, to heal the environment through the lens of a Chinese um, ritual to the ancestors, which is my ancestry. I'm going to pause here because the video is a bit long um, and then go into the final piece of project that I did for my thesis, which was more looking at how do we create a community around this idea of using mushrooms as a way to solve environmental problems. So this project was called Internet of Mycelium. And uh, this was I used this project to cover. So for thesis, there are different classes that you take and you have to create different artifacts. I decided that I really wanted to pour everything into like one idea. So I spanned it throughout. So there was um, a business model after this, an actual um, product prototype that I created, um, the experience system, as well as like, how do we bring this to market? And what does the user journey look like? Um, so this is a sample of the website that I created that has all of this information, but it's a kit that um, people can order that will arrive that is customized to your soil needs. Um, and you would be performing DIY mycoremediation, which is using the growth of mushrooms to um, remediate any sort of toxins in your soils. And this is because it's a much more affordable and environmental way to do it. But also a lot of it was about um, how do we leverage this also as a knowledge sharing platform so that we can use this product as a way to heal, but also as a way like a platform where you can share um, different knowledge about what you're doing so that you can have a more global 
um, or countrywide view of this. And um, just wanted to, you know, brag a little bit that I was able to score two Core 77 awards from this, which was really amazing to get that sort of affirmation around this project because I'm still continuing to work on it um, through my research and through teaching. So this is also something I do on the side is taking pieces of my thesis and working with like local community labs to um, teach these different methods. And so finally, what I do at RGA. Um, so at RGA, which is an experience design and ad agency, I work at the intersection of strategy and design. So I create strategic frameworks for products and services. And then I work with visual designers and technologists to make these ideas come to life. So I will give you a quick example of um, some of the work I've done. So this is Nike is one of our main clients as I'm in Portland. And this was a project called Member Days. So this was really Nike trying to highlight their membership program. And the work that I did, and it was really fun and tied a lot of the things I learned at POD, a lot of the skill sets together is I was responsible basically for looking at um, all of the different touch points that um, Nike was looking at both like, phys like physical and digital and figuring out like, how do we create a connected um, like infrastructure around membership and making people feel like they're part of a community. And finally, just a glimpse into some of the more like cultural work that I do um, on the side is just like doing spatial and graphic design for different art institutions and et cetera. And so thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to me present my work. And here is my email if you want to reach out. And if you have any questions um, about the program or my work, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, again, amazing to just, you know, trip down memory lane of the thesis. And I do want to acknowledge, you know, the pandemic has just been an enormous effect on students, some students, you know, ending in the pandemic, some students beginning in the pandemic, students making it through the pandemic. So um, just showed unbelievable bravery and fortitude to wrap this thing up with such success. Helen, my question for you is really a balance between just how mission driven your work was, uh, it still is, but, you know, thinking about the thesis work, um, and yet how light and experimental it was. And I'm wondering, if you if that was easy for you or if that was actually challenging for you um i would say that i definitely it was a lot of mental gymnastics but it was the type that i wanted to go through that was really rewarding because i think um you know there is with the space of like speculative design and um, how it's really integrated in a way into design curriculum right now. Um, I think it's a really cool tool because it allows us to really like think and manifest new systems and ways of doing things. But what I found an issue with it was it a lot of times veered so much into like science fiction that I loved so much. But then as a designer, I, um, you know, had to like deal with like my practicality and feeling like, what am I like trying to solve or address? So I think the balance came from just like having that opportunity to experiment and play and seeing the out outcomes, the actual physical outcomes within like your science lab, which was the POD kitchen. Um, and taking that and, you know, thinking about it from a lens of like, what, how can I use what I discovered um, and make it into like things that I can leverage, tools that I can leverage. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, actually, this is the perfect segue. I wanted to move into a phase where we're gonna meet some of our faculty. And Helen, unless I'm wrong, there were some interesting conversations, early morning conversations in the kitchen where you were talking about listening to mycelium, that mushroom grows and is a living thing and actually makes sound, but we couldn't hear the sound. 
but what if we could? And so I actually want to move to Victoria Shen. Actually, everybody make sure you're on um, speaker view as opposed to gallery um, so you can see, because I don't think people are going to be sharing slides. Um, Victoria um, Shen is joining us from the Bay Area, and she teaches a course that she'll talk about called Smart Objects, but that is actually kind of related to this pursuit about how do we hear things um, that uh, that may not obviously be making sound. Welcome, welcome, Victoria. Maybe you can talk a little bit about who you are, what you're doing, and your course. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so Helen, I loved your projects. They're really incredible, incredibly expansive uh, in topics much like mycelium. Um, there are, there's actually a huge burgeoning, um, well, like huge subculture of uh, modular nerds who are using synthesizers to sonify mycelium growth and activity. Um, but uh, maybe I can email you some videos or something like that. Um, but anyway, it's very much um, a, a live uh, community. Um, so, yep, I'm Victoria. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am mostly a touring noise musician, a composer, and artist based in uh, the Bay Area, like Alan said. Uh, I produce things like instruments, installations, wearables, because my background is pretty diverse, um, half in fine arts and half in kind of the technical world. Um, I've done a lot of digital fabrication, like CNC machining, uh, 3D printing, laser cutting, electronics, uh, this type of thing. Um, and uh, personally, my, my practice likes to uh, incorporate and, and blend analog and digital technologies. Uh, most recently, I, I did this project where I um, made acrylic nails with record styluses on them. So you could play a record uh, with your fingers uh, individually up to five tracks at once. I figured out uh, how to uh, cast, like make my own uh, records out of resin and then also like make my own uh, turntables with a uh, changeable speed, uh, axes and uh, direction. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I've been into lately. And um, so I'm teaching for the second time this course called Material Sound. Uh, it's going to be really hands-on and it's about uh, how to rapidly prototype projects, designs, art, that uh, focus on sound is also going to be a crash, a crash course in like the history of sound art and kind of approaches in performance too. So it's kind of like a three pronged uh, course. Uh, we're going to integrate uh, principles in engineering, computer science, um, the fine arts, like I said, uh, with uh, all in the service of integrating sound in very intentional and informed ways in your uh, personal projects, if you take the class. Um, and so we're gonna go over a lot of fundamentals, like uh, just how to record, how to edit audio, but then also go into more kind of specialized things like psychoacoustics, like instrument design, a lot of DIY electronics, microcontrollers, Arduino, stuff, you name it. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to be teaching this again. And uh, we're gonna do a week on performance, kind of like what I alluded to. And I think that's going to push some of the students a little bit out of their comfort zone. Um, it's kind of my my wheelhouse, but it didn't come naturally. So it'll be interesting to see um, students uh, approaching that for the first time if if this is indeed the first time they're um, they're performing in a live context. Um, but yeah, that's it. Material sound. That's my course. Great course. Um, a couple follow ups, um, Victoria. So we're really, really adamant on the role of play. I mean, I think our visitors can see so many of these projects are so purposeful and like dealing with some of the most challenging, um, you know, ideas and uh, areas in the world. And we have found that, um, that students, really designers, I think in general, unless they are like making stuff and unless that making has just this huge element of actually not problem solving, we, ha we have a course called Design Delight actually. Um, I think it's so important that yours is one of the courses where students can actually just play and have joy. Now, I, you know, there may be some people going, this was a very hard course. Like, yes, we played, but it was like lots of homework and all that. But I'm wondering if you could um, talk about the role of play a little bit. And also, you are one of our, um, one of the teachers who really um, was just coming to the rescue last year to teach online. And it was a tricky thing. Like, could you actually teach your course online? And it was so incredibly successful that even though we are back in person, um, we wanted to stick with teachers who were just, you know, crushed it um, remotely. 
So maybe in addition to talking a little bit about the role of play in education, if you could talk a little bit about maybe some of the challenges and opportunities of teaching remotely. I know that your final was a performance on Twitch, uh, which was pretty amazing, um, which is like remote. Um, so it's sort of fascinating. Anyway, take it away. Yeah, uh, play. I think uh, play is great because uh, it's all about the element of surprise and then being loose and not having to feel like you have to conquer a, a, a problem. So it's kind of like the journey is more of the, um, the focus than the destination. But um, yeah, I mean, it is through play that I think that the greatest innovations have, have you know, come to arise. And uh, plays in sound is actually something that just comes naturally because you, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between your interaction with an object and the sound that it produces. Really, mm -hmm. there's so many things that are so unexpected. And I think, um, it, not to say it infantilizes, but it kind of like uh, makes people feel like, not to say young again, but just, you know, in this kind of in awe state. And they just want to yeah. interact over and over again and like find different techniques, uh, like extended, whatever, otherwise uh, to... Uh, interact with these objects and, and to make and to elaborate on objects that are either everyday kind of objects. So uh, we have students that take ready-mades, things that are pre-existing, and then they kind of um, augment their relationship to it in order to activate it sonically mm -hmm. or just design things like out of the ether, you know? Um, and so this class is like really open-ended. So it's very um, in, in open-ended in terms of their final projects and what you design. So it's very much plays into the concept of play and the ludic. And I think it's very important uh, to, yeah, have joy, experience joy, especially during a time that is so uh, like doomy and gloomy. Um, and so you were talking about also- Yeah, I was asking about like teaching at a distance, but maybe I also want to ask you about like the role of performance in design. Uh, we actually have a course called Design Performance, but um, it's very literal um, in your course and in your life. Right, so I think the, the strength in performance is that there is a liveness to it that allows the designer to, to uh, interact with the audience and engage the audience in a way that just a standalone object would not have the power to. And I think uh, that's why people still go to concerts. That's why people were really kind of uh, crawling out of their skin when they were stuck at home during shelter in place is because they crave this liveness and this human to human engagement. And it really begs the designer to uh, have to rethink what their relationship is to the objects that they're designing and activating live. And then also um, just the engagement of the object and themselves with the audience. And this is something that oftentimes, like in my background is in visual arts, you produce art and then you kind of leave it in the gallery uh, and it's kind of dead in this way. And the, um, the strength in performance is that you as a third party are there to, to kind of, um, recontextualize and uh, engage the audience. Amazing. Um, I just, I cannot wait to see what the students, uh, I, I, I attended that, um, the concert on Twitch uh, last year. And I think that that was really the beginning of, of a new tradition here. So I can't wait to see what the students come up with. Can't wait for you to meet them soon, right? Um, well, please stick around. Um, Toshi, let's move to you next. Toshi Mogi, who has been teaching um, in the program four years, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, way more than four years, but for years, <laughs> um, welcome. And maybe you can talk to us a little bit about who you are and what you do, uh, and then a little bit about your course. You have a 15-week course. We, we, have, we have actually not so many 15-week courses. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of seven-week courses, and 15 weeks is a huge commitment that you've taken on. There is so much to learn about business fundamentals. I don't think we can shorten it. We don't want to because we're so... Uh, fantastic and effective that the students have such affection for you. Anyway, take it away. Maybe yeah, you sure. Share, share what right. you're up to. Well, Thanks. As you guys um, can probably see by my um, imitation Patagonia sweater vest, I teach a business class and um, it, it, it's called Business Structures and uh, it's meant to really give the designers the fundamental knowledge, um, working knowledge, as well as comfort and confidence in um, uh, business concepts, but also with interacting and working alongside um, other business strategists or, you know, developing their own business strategy capabilities themselves. Um, I'm Toshi Mogi. I'm uh, AVP of strategy at Frog Design. I've been at Frog for a decade now. Um, 
and I, I lead a strategy practice. I lead a um, financial services discipline as well. Um, I'm, I'm working a lot with, uh, in my, my day job with um, um, big companies, small companies to help them really innovate, to help them design their products of the future, to help them think, think about where they can have impact uh, going forward and dealing with the challenges that they're facing, um, such as, you know, how do they react to the, um, the ESG challenges, the, the, the environmental, um, um, social and governance challenges that uh, are changing the nature of what these companies are now promising to deliver um, above, above and beyond shareholder value, um, as well as, um, you know, working with these clients to, to bring new new concepts and new new ideas to market, um, so the the course is designed to uh, help people regardless of their background. Maybe you have a very uh, strong business background, or maybe you have no business background at all. Um, the goal is to get everybody uh, up to speed and familiar with the basic concepts of business. Um, I don't have an MBA, but I did work at places like McKinsey where, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of learning and knowledge um, about the business world. Um, I don't have a design background. I'll, however, I do have a PhD in engineering. So I uh, bring a lot of that technical rigor um, to, to bear. Um, and, you know, my, my uh, real, real, real value that I, that I um, can bring to the appreciation of where people with with design backgrounds or without design backgrounds even, um, but, the, but people who are working with the, um, in a design profession in the future, um, how they can connect with um, the strategy side of things. So I, I teach um, everything about business in 15 weeks. So by the time you're done, uh, you're, you're gonna have maybe not the deepest uh, set of knowledge, but at least uh, a, a basic understanding of things from macroeconomics. How does how does the how does the market work? When you know it, it, a lot of it is very interactive. So um, I will introduce topics and um, invite the students to to you know bring up what the latest they are confused about or what they heard or what they don't understand. If they uh, we we hear about interest rates changing. What does that mean? And how does that you know is that important to me? Last semester we were talking uh, extensively about NFTs and and what they are and where where is the value there. So um, I introduce a lot of frameworks. I think you'll be frameworks. talking about them again too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, quite and a year it's been talking about DAOs and crypto. So you know, um, it, you know, I, that's what I want. I want to have that interactive conversation. I want people to, you know, they're hearing these business concepts. They may be intimidated. They may be um, just uh, uh, it, it not, not confident in, in those, but I want to have a, an environment where they can bring it up and say, Hey, what is this? And, you know, if I, if I understand it, um, I'll explain it. If I don't, I'll look into it and we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll learn about it together. Um, we, we, there's there's a, a a part of the course where I teach frameworks, business frameworks. So this is a really uh, interesting one for designers, where you know it's a visualization of certain business concepts, um, and I try to draw the real basic business concepts. Um, you know, Porter's five forces or Ansoff diagrams or even the Kano diagram, for instance, um, for for those of you who know. Um, but these are frameworks that I believe that you know all all strategists should know. You know, design strategists should know. Um, but I want to make sure that the designers know it as well. Um, and in fact, um, at Frog, somebody asked me to teach their, uh, to teach a, uh, um, the internal Frog um, teams this business framework um, uh, uh, session. So I took all my uh, notes and my, my slides from the, the uh, SVA POD class and I presented it and, and people loved it. They were, they wanted more of it. Right. So this is a level of, um, uh, 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 of teaching that, that I, that I really want to, I want to make sure that, um, these things are connected to real, real life, real world, um, problems and that you can use these things. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's the beauty of it. We, 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 you know, we get through the full spectrum of things. I want to teach innovation. I want to teach about, um, you know, even motivations and value, um, and you know, I'm open to hearing many different views and trying to, um, trying to, um, as I said, get people much more familiar with business and much more uh, a practical knowledge of it, and um, and to just 
come out of it with more confidence. I had, I had forgotten when we had first met again, 10 years ago, you've been teaching this courses from the beginning <laughs> and you had said, you know, we're talking and your reputation had preceded you and you had mentioned, so I don't have an MBA. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not worrying about that. And you're so, I also don't have a design background. And I'm like, no, I'm not really worried about that either. <laughs> Um, and it's turned out perfectly. The other thing that I just popped into my head, remember we had a, a student, Kevin, who actually had an undergraduate business degree, a four-year degree. Right. Um, and he was in your class. And I remember I was, that was the, I just typed in the, in the chat, I had sat in one evening. And, and so at the coffee break, I sat down next to him and I said, so, you know, you did a four-year degree, undergraduate degree in business. Is a lot of this like, you know, repetitive, redundant for you? And he looked at me, he says, oh, Alan, we don't have business courses like this in business school um, with a big smile on his face. So um, that was really, really uh, affirming. Uh, Toshi, I want to just follow up. Um, you know, one of the things that we really, really pride ourselves on at SVA in general and in, in our department is an all adjunct faculty, that all of our faculty are working professionals in their field of their domain of expertise. And, uh, and we're always encouraging faculty to please bring in anecdotes. And if you had like a terrible meeting that afternoon, like, can you share it with the students? The students really love that stuff. Um, and you do that, right? Like, do you have any particular memory of something that yeah. you brought in that the students were like, oh, like, I definitely want to be in the design world now, or I definitely may not. <laughs> I got to question this a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to comment on that, too. I mean, not only, Alan, do, do you and the, 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 the team that bring in uh, the professionals, but you bring in the professionals who are at the top of their game. And it's not, you know, that's, that you, I'm not speaking for myself, but all the other folks that, that um, are on the faculty, they're, they're just, you know, if you, if you look them up, they're really uh, exceptional people. So uh, um, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, in the past I would, I would teach the courses in the Frog Studio um, and, uh, you know, after my full day, uh, day job, you know, I have the students coming in and, and we have uh, our sessions. And so it's kind of hard to separate my day job from uh, my, my evening job. But um, we, we've, uh, you know, it, it often becomes a topic of discussion. Um, we walk through, in one case, a, a full case study of a... Um, a client that we had and a project that we had a, a, a venture, a VC comp, um, a, a venture that Frog worked with and um, created a, a product, took it to market. We even have videos of them manufacturing it in China and, uh, and, and launching it. And, you know, this company in the early days of teaching the class, this company was very successful. Um, it's gone through so many iterations and, and, you know, challenges and failures and rebirths that, um, you know, it's, it's become much more of a, 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 a nuanced story. And, um, it really, uh, gives, gives us a chance to take kind of a real life, uh, example of things and, um, and, and see how it, how the ups and downs, of a real business happen um, kind of in, in, in real time. Yeah, well, very lucky students. Thank you so much for, for being <laughs> here, Toshi. So I actually wanna to move to HK because we'll move from Toshi who's been teaching for all of the years of the program to HK who has actually has not taught yet. Um, HK, your, your course, your brand new course um, on uh, imagining climate futures um, starts next semester. So I thought it'd be really interesting to have you join us tonight to talk about like what you're going to be doing um, because this is a brand new course um, with a very, very interesting um, strategy for how to uh, teach and how to learn about um, climate crisis. Welcome. Thanks. And, you know, Alan, I, I do want to say I really appreciate you, uh, your level of risk taking on this one. Um, given that I'm a, I'm a new teacher, this is a complicated subject to teach. Um, I'm super excited about it. And I think, I, I, I believe uh, that the students and I were, are going to be able to come up with something interesting out of it. But um, it's definitely, a, it's an experiment, this first one. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of background about the course, um, uh, and you know how I came to it. I have been spending the last few years in a career transition after many years of design technology, design thinking, you know, management consulting world. 
um, moved into uh, looking at climate change from um, an urban, poli uh, urban policy and urban planning perspective and have really, um, you know, have sort of redirected my, my life. And as we, um, as I was talking with Alan about a potential climate course this summer, and one of the things that I was describing was the emotional experience that I went through just learning what was at stake um, in understanding the climate crisis. Like once you really understand what's happening, um, you have, there's this sort of roller coaster. Um, it's, it's really difficult to understand the scale of climate change. It's sort of this like Timothy Morton hyper object construct. You can't really look at it and see all of it from one perspective. Um, but we know that it's really going to unsettle and disrupt everything we know about how to be in the world. And you, you can't just be an attentive reader of the news and sort of understand and get an appropriate frame of reference to understand what's going to happen. And, and what ends up happening if you just kind of do that on your own is that you feel terrified and confused and, and distracted, or you think, kind of think it's too abstract, it's out of my control. And so through this class, um, I'm hoping to kind of create a structured emotional process that we'll go through. We can learn about what's at stake, but do it in this very thoughtful, detailed way, guided by writing and research by some of the most inventive, thoughtful um, climate research, but researchers, but also other kinds of researchers, historians, um, philosophers out there. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna start by looking at at grief. Um, and loss, right? We're, we're all going to be facing loss of home and life and stability. Um, what does that loss look like? Um, what's, you know, what are, what are the real stakes um, as, as we kind of go deep into, into the reality of climate change? From there, we ask about, you know, why? Why are we in the situation that we're in? Who, who can we point at to say, you know, who's responsible? Um, and that's really about rage, right? Like we should feel some anger here. The only question is who, where do we direct that anger? Um, and how do we learn from that anger about where to go next? Um, how to do things differently next time? Um, then of course, we're gonna think about disorientation because this is a process that's going to completely disrupt our social, moral, political, economic, structures, reclassify all of the classifications that exist now, right? Like how do borders work in a world in which people can't live, literally cannot live in some parts of the world? Um, how do we think about legal frameworks? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a, a challenging process to think about what it means when all of the ontologies that structure the way we think about the world begin to collapse. Um, but then, you know, <laughs> to turn things around and be a little bit more hopeful, we do look at the ways in which people are um, uh, addressing these problems, right? Like, how do we move away from the trite dystopian narratives that these kinds of pathways of thought can lead us down? Um, we're going to reject dystopian methods and look at the ways that people have been challenging them. Um, and from there, we'll look at all the different manifestos that people have created. You know, there's the Dark Mountain Manifesto and the Extinction Rebellion Manifesto, and there's dozens of different ways and philosophies that people have created um, on in the face of climate change. Um, you know, how are they, how are people thinking about solving the problems? And then we're going to end with Donna Haraway's idea of staying with the trouble which is really about staying present and engaged in these challenges without surrendering to doomism or denial. And there are, there are examples that are out there, um, people who are acknowledging the trouble, activating their networks, activating their communities, collaborating, and as Haraway sort of ends with this idea of making kin and thinking about the different ways in which we, we sort of learn to be in the world. And that's, so that's the process and there'll be a, some assignments and um, different ways of, you know, developing sort of imaginative narratives that describe how we, you know, how we redirect potential dystopian futures into more productive, imaginative, positive ways of 
being. So that was a lot. <laughs> I can't, I think probably everybody, like I'm just so excited about seeing how this can happen. Again, teaching climate through the lens of emotion from despair and rage to hope um, is just, I think it's uh, radical and, and, and I think it's going to be amazing. And also working with you back and forth on the actual syllabus, the scholarship, the foundational readings um, that the students are going to delve into as, you know, it's, this is really, there's some studio, but it's a lot of seminar um, style study. I think that the students will just be so conversant um, in contemporary uh, thought, writing, reading, and debate um, in something that I think is just, you know, our early conversations were like, well, how do, if it's already over, like, how do we even teach this? How do you, how do you learn about it? Like, why would you even learn about it kind of thing? If everyone's telling us this is, our, this is already over. And so this seems just so unbelievably um, hopeful to me. Just really, really excited. I would end with one question to you, which is, if this is through the lens of emotion, what is the emotion um, that you're coming to um, teach this class with? Well, I mean, obviously, um, a little bit of terror, you know, it's a, it's a challenging class, and it's going to be, I'm going to be asking students that are sort of hoping to think about design to read some stuff that's, you know, potentially sort of pithy and challenging and, and exercise writing skills, um, and other things. So there might be, I'm a little worried that People aren't going to like the assignments, <laughs> so we'll get, we can get there. No um, teacher's ever been worried about that. That's amazing. <laughs> um, but mostly I'm just really excited about it yeah. because the point is to think together about mm -hmm. how to fend off despair and paralysis and yeah. defeatism and create a plan of action. And I think like yeah. a group yeah. of smart, creative people working together to imagine a new future is just, that sounds like a kind of a way I'd like to spend my Tuesday morning. Yeah, I think we'd want to be around. Um, we have had design and climate courses in the past, um, and this is really a reinvention. Uh, and again, I think a brand new and just like very, very contemporary and sensitive way. Can't wait. Thanks thanks for, for joining us and, and, and describing something that hasn't happened yet, which is, I think is amazing. Um, we have one more faculty to, um, for you to meet tonight, Julie O'Brien. Uh, Julie, welcome. So Julie teaches a behavioral psychology class that is also new and it just, it happened. Um, and, uh, and this is a course that we've wanted to have for a really long time. And it took us a while to find you, Julie, and we're so glad we did. And the students just really loved it. I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself a little bit about what you're doing and what your course was all about. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it was it was a ton of fun. I, I'm so glad I had the opportunity to teach it. Um, I'm Julie. I'm a behavioral scientist. I'm the senior vice president and head of behavioral science at US Bank. Um, but I've spent my career uh, toggling back and forth between academia and industry. I started out with a PhD in social psychology, and I was studying racism and discrimination. And then I uh, wanted to do something different. So I went to a tech startup in the energy efficiency space. And then um, went back to academia and spent some time at Duke University and did a lot of consulting on the side and uh, and then went to another company, uh, WW, uh, formerly Weight Watchers, and then about six months ago moved over to banking. So um, what I have learned throughout my career is that there's lots of different problems in the world that we need to solve. Like I have a, a slide that I use that kind of lists all of the various problems. And we've actually heard about many of them tonight. Um, and when we start out trying to solve those problems, they often look really different in nature because we're paying attention to the surface details that describe those problems. Um, and as a, a social scientist and a behavioral scientist, what I've learned is that there's actually some common threads that are, that are really present in all of these problems that we wanna solve. And it all comes down to human psychology and, and decision-making and behavior change. Um, and so as I've gone through my career and, and worked in these very different settings, I've really cared a lot about how you can distill the thing that's the fundamental truth of human nature in a way that is not overly complex, but still useful and accurate. Um, and then meet that with the real world where you can take it and build things that are actually really effective. So uh, the course is, is sort of like a, a 
summary of how I've spent my life <laughs> in adulthood, really. Um, and so there's kind of two pieces of it. One piece is the concepts of behavioral science. So what are the fundamental human uh, patterns that we can identify in any problem space or any domain that we want to try and work in? Um, and there's basically you know, five basic fundamental principles that, that govern almost all of human behavior. So we spend a bit of time going deep on those five basic principles. Um, and then the other half of the class is designed to kind of bring that into the real world. So um, we do some design methods that are sort of marrying behavioral science and design. So we do things like behavior mapping and some ideation that is really focused around articulating the theory of change or sort of the active ingredient in our solutions that we think is gonna give us the most impact to behavior. So um, I kind of think about this as an opportunity for just being really precise around what we're designing and why um, as a solution to solve behavioral problems. Um, so we spend some time on that. And then we actually ran two experiments, like actual legit online lab experiments, the kind that I used to uh, work with students in my, in my graduate training and in academia, uh, we class of designers ran two experiments. So that was really cool um, and learned how to interpret data from two experiments as part of the design process. So it was a ton of fun. We also had guest speakers from lots of different domains to sort of help us learn how to apply these really fundamental basic principles to all of these problems that look really different on the surface. Um, and, I, and I think it was it was great for me too. I also learned a lot from the students and um, just had a really nice experience. Um, I know that behavioral economics in particular is a, such a fun thing to, to learn about. And I sat in on, on half of your class and like just learned more than I had in a long, long time. <laughs> um, are there any sort of, can you share like one thing that like people might, you know, be interested to, to know that they can maybe take into their lives this week, into their businesses or into their their friendships, something, you know, because I, I felt like it was just like a lot of the keys to the kingdom when I was sitting <laughs> in on your course, like, oh, this is how people work. This is actually very useful to know. <laughs> Any little favorite thing. tidbit? Yeah. My favorite thing. Um, yeah, I mean, this is not a specific concept, but I think what behavioral science has taught me is that often the thing we assume to be true is just not true. Um, and so I like to live my life like a scientist and sort of question the assumptions that I make and assume that there's always an alternative explanation. And, you know, humans are fundamentally social creatures, but we don't always get the social part right. And um, I think it's it's just, it's really helped me, um, you know, experience life in a, in a better way to take the approach of like, maybe I'm not right. Maybe my conclusions are not right. Maybe there's a different explanation for what I'm observing or feeling or encountering. And, and I think that's kind of the essence of science. Science is never done. Um, and if we can learn how to sort of remove ourselves from the biases of our own experiences and the assumptions that we bring, we start to see things that, that we might not have seen otherwise. That's so beautiful. Um, and, you know, in terms of you're thinking just about this, uh, this um, marriage between emotion and scholarship uh, in, in HK's upcoming course, it was really similar with, with you in talking about preparing for the course of this marriage between academia and practice. And you had a really unique um, like optimism around like, you know, we, we need them both and we need them together. Yeah. And it just, it, it was seemed to be really evidenced in the kind of culture and temperature that you were able to cultivate in the class. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so it is 10 to 9, and we had promised ourselves and everybody that this would not um, go over, that it would actually go a little short. So if people want to just do a gallery view, um, if you have any questions about the program itself, I would say reach out, reach out to us directly. But if you have um, any questions over sort of these last few minutes for any of our um, presenters, the students, the faculty, or the alumni that you wanted to ask, um, maybe you can unmute and do so, or you can type it into the chat if you're not so comfortable. And also, if our students and alumni or faculty have a question of each other, I would say go for it. Um, because again, some of the more nuts and bolts questions around the actual department and the application process. Um, before we wrap, I will say that our application deadline is January 15th. Um, everything that you should uh, that you'd want to know is on the apply page. 
If you're in New York, we would love you to come by and take a tour, visit, sit in on a class, hang out with some students. Um, if you're not in New York, uh, definitely get in touch with us and see if you'd like to Zoom, um, if you want us to take a look at your portfolio, particularly if you don't have a background in design and you're not sure. Uh, we love um, looking at students and accepting students who don't have design backgrounds, so don't let that slow you down. Uh, so definitely get in touch with us online if you're not in New York. And if you're in New York, please do come for a visit. Anyway, for just a couple of minutes, if you have any questions, I think we've got some questions in the chat, actually.